but it's good that you didn't step up on this platform. <laughs> you would look like the dog or up here. <laughs> the word epiphany denotes a sudden, momentous realization, potentially life-changing. In the church here, the season of epiphany begins tomorrow with the visit of the Magi to the child Jesus. <coughs> now these people were astrologers, not astronomers, astrologers, whose vocation was studying the stars for signs of something really big happening, or some potentially some new trend that would be major in human life. Today we might call them a think tank. <laughs> We have deduced that there were three of them because three gifts are listed in Matthew's Gospel. Gold, denoting the royal lineage of this child. Frankincense, denoting his divinity. And myrrh, denoting his mortality. Actually, you know, <coughs> there was a fourth visitor who was spurned because he came bearing a fruitcake. <laughs> Imagine reading in Matthew's Gospel that the Magi came bearing gold, frankincense, myrrh, and fruitcake. No, really. Today we laugh at the idea of people looking at the stars to guide their thinking or to perceive trends. <coughs> Instead, we look for signs and trends. Uh, that might be important in opinion polls, in the Dow Jones and Twitter. And most of us, if we confess it, do read our daily horoscopes. However we view these guys, we must acknowledge that they acted. They acted following the best light that they had and that they were open to a new vision, which might be life-changing. Now, they couldn't just load up the car, set the GPS, and hit the interstate. Their journey involved organizing, huge organizing, for animals, large and medium-sized, for armed guards, because they would be prey for the bandits along the way, for lots of slaves, and camping provisions for all of these. I have to wonder, given my background, I wonder when they got their funding. <laughs> Today's reading from John's Gospel brings into focus a story of someone else, John, John the Baptist, bearing witness to the light of God. This reading issues to us the call, the challenge, and the privilege of both discerning where God's light is breaking into the darkness of our world and ourselves becoming witness to that light. That light, the light of God, which can never be overcome. Do you believe that? The light of God, the darkness, shall never overcome it. Now let me say that I do agree with the theologian, I don't know who he was, who asserted that our hope is not in human progress. Our hope is in the sovereignty of God. And I'm guided by that liberation theologian who decades ago wrote, unconditional love can allow itself the most absurd desires. It can pray for them and it can work for them precisely because it does not make the existence of God depend on the fulfillment of our desires. But still, with that warning still I resonate with the words of a longtime Quaker activist who encourages us to pay close attention to the positive news lurking beneath the headlines. Victor highlighted some of that positive news, some of that light breaking into the darkness in his Christmas Eve sermon. Here are a few more. <coughs> The governor of Tennessee, Tennessee, one of those deep south states that people like to make fun of, 
the governor of Tennessee announced that refugees will be welcomed and help to resettle and rebuild their lives in the state of Tennessee. In so doing, he defied the titular head of his political party, as well as some wealthy and influential individuals, and he has incurred their wrath. He has, in fact, risked his career. Why? My faith, he said, led me to this decision. Governor Bill Lee, bearing witness to the light that shines in our darkness. <clears throat> the staff of Catholic Charities in Tennessee is confident that the campaign they organized, the many calls, the emails, the letters to the governor were influential in encouraging and supporting his decision. Remember that when you feel that your efforts are not worthwhile and do not have any effect. Shift the locale. Sex trafficking gangs all over the world prey on the poor and the vulnerable. In Pakistan, it has been documented that in the last couple of years, 629 young girls have been sold into China, pre presumably to become brides. A few have made it back home, scarred in body and mind by the brutal treatment they have had to endure. Salim Iqbal, anybody know who he is? No. He's one of our unsung heroes. Salim Iqbal is part of a group of Christian activists who have rescued some, some girls and successfully intervened in the sake of others. The Pakistani government, mindful of the lucrative trade with China, has either ignored or actually interfered with the efforts to save these girls. <coughs> Bill Lee risked his career. Salim Iqbal and his co-workers are risking their lives to bear witness to the light of God shining in the darkness, in that terrible darkness. Come to San Francisco. Barbara came to Safe House with a mission to earn back her nurse's license. <clears throat> Barbara had led the police on a three-county chase, which ended, thankfully, when her car ran out of gas. Barbara was drunk. As a result, she lost her nurse's license. That license, that precious license, would allow her to carry on with what she believed was her God-given calling. She ended up on the streets, beautiful, statuesque, addicted. She was an instant target of traffickers. When she came to Safe House, Barbara, Barbara's self-esteem was so blasted by her time in jail and on the streets, she continually sabotaged herself. She could not believe she was worthy to succeed. But the months of therapy and other and loving support which she received at Safe House brought her to healing and to graduation 10 years ago. Thank God, 10 years ago. While she was, while she was at Safe House, she took a job cleaning up in a, an upscale fitness center on the Embarcadero. She continued with that job after she graduated because she needed money to live, obviously, and she needed money to continue with this arduous and fairly expensive regimen, which would allow her to once again regain that license and to pursue her God-given calling, and she made it. Yes. She worked for a while at San Quentin and at Soledad. Now she works for an agency in Alameda. Um, she goes, um, in pursuit of that work as a nurse, she goes into some pretty scuzzy hotels. She crosses 
railroad tracks to find her patients in homeless encampments. They need her for help in staying on their medications, and they need her to give healing injections, which she brings with her. It's so awful, Linda, she said, with tears in her eyes. There is so much suffering, it should not be like this. Are you ever afraid, I ask? No, I have faith that whatever happens, whatever happens, God will take care of me. With a wry smile, she added, she do wear hospital scrubs, so everybody knows who I am. With the power of the Holy Spirit, this wounded woman transformed her life, and she now risked that life in order to bear witness to the light of God. For three years, Barbara has had a life partner who is also in recovery. A devout Catholic, Barbara said, it's so good to be with somebody I can pray with, even if he is a Baptist. <laughs> Another St. Louis graduate left a well-paying job to accept lower wages so that she might work at St. Louis. Recently, she led the effort to open an outreach center for homeless, sex trafficked, and prostituted women. It is not easy to find an affordable site in San Francisco, and a place which looked pretty good, even or was rejected, even though it, the search would be long. It was rejected because it had been a pornography shop and the vibes were not right. After a long search for funding and for uh, for a location and for funding to operate it, a center was opened on Hyde Street, offering individual therapy, groups focusing on trauma recovery, women's empowerment, addiction treatment, case management, finding housing, and, and to the unwelcome respite from the streets. At this point, there are 40 women on the waiting list for Safe House, the residential program. This center is, a, among other things, is a way to keep in touch and to work with those women so that we don't lose them. So, I don't know if you make New Year's resolutions, but let me make this suggestion. Make a resolution which is twofold. Persistently, persistently, look for those people, places, and events where the light of God is breaking again into the darkness of our world. And when you find these pause, take a deep breath and give thanks. Really give thanks. How nice does it do it? Actually passed over something I meant to tell you, so I'm going to go back. Soon after the center was opened on Hyde Street, some members of this congregation purchased and prepared an elegant feast for the center. For any of the women who came in. A discreet sign on the buffet table told everyone that this came from Calvary Presbyterian Church. And near Christmas, sandwiches, many sandwiches were prepared here and delivered in bags which had been decorated by the children here. The light of God breaking into the darkness, bearing witness to the light of God's love for her daughters, our sisters, on the streets. Back to the New Year's resolution. Seek and open yourself to epiphany, potentially life-changing breakthrough in consciousness. And when you ask yourself, when you look at God's beloved world, what breaks your heart the most? Find others. Remember the people in Tennessee who brought about a major change. Find others working on the same societal injustice, the meanness, the violence, which is writ large in our political structures. And learn from the Magi. Resolve to act. Becoming one who is bearing witness to the light of God's love breaking into the darkness. Friends, 
Arise, your light is gone. Rise up like eagles on the wing. God's power will make us strong. Do you believe that? If so, amen.